Seba, sebagian dari S2 arsitektur hmm. ada rasa kota dan uh, satu arsitektur ya uh, kita hari ini mendapat kehormatan ada Pak Seksan yang datang ke arsitektur uh, ITB atas uh, permintaan uh, kami uh, kami berterima kasih sekali Pak Seksan uh, bersedia untuk hampir kemari untuk uh, berbagi pengalamannya mengenai Uh, hari ini topiknya tentang uh, ini keterlibatan masyarakat di dalam perancangan uh, ruang publik ya, ruang kota. Jadi uh, pengalaman beliau di uh, Kuala Lumpur akan menceritakan bagaimana sih uh, merancang ruang publik itu melibatkan uh, masyarakat atau pengunjungnya. Ya, uh, kalau di Bandung kita lihat sudah mulai banyak taman-taman dan sebagainya, tetapi itu dirancang entah oleh siapa ya nah, kita tidak terima nah, ini uh, kalau uh, pengguna atau masyarakat ikut seperti apa hasilnya dan tentunya uh, banyak pengalaman yang bisa kita belajar bersama sekali lagi kami ucapkan terima kasih banyak atas kesediaan uh, Pak Sesan untuk uh, sharing mengenai hal ini dan uh, waktunya kami silakan satu-satu oke saya Selamat sore, sambil nunggu bahan yang disiapkan Barangkali saya ingin memperkenalkan secara singkat saja Tamu kita hari ini Jadi kita sangat berterima kasih karena Pak Seksan Sejak menempatkan waktu untuk mampir di dalam waktu yang hebat sebetulnya Dan jadwalnya cukup ketat ya Jadi saya kira kita sangat beruntung bisa melihatkan pengalaman dia ya karena menurut saya banyak hal yang bisa kita pelajari dari apa yang disampaikan oleh Seksan So thank you again Seksan Kemudian juga Saya sebenarnya mengenal video ini sudah cukup lama At one point in our life We met in the project back 25 years ago? Yeah, I think it's not 25 years ago Tetapi pada zaman ini, dua puluh lima tahun yang lalu kami tanpa sengaja sih kita punya kesempatan bekerja sama dengan sebuah projek dulu. Sejak itu saya mengikuti perkembangan pasaran di dalam karir ini sebagai seorang lanskap kita. Sebenarnya backgroundnya kalau tidak salah S satu nya engineering, tapi kemudian melanjutkan ke lanskap arsitektur. Tapi selain mengerjakan proyek-proyek lanskap juga pasaran ini juga banyak mengerjakan proyek-proyek arsitektur juga dalam salah skala kecil dan uh, beliau dikenal untuk proyek-proyek arsitekturnya dalam uh, seri seperti ini uh, proyek-proyek uh, hotel yang sangat unik ya di berbagai kota Kolumbo, Ipoh, kemudian uh, Penang dan sebagainya jadi saya kira uh, hari ini kita akan mendengarkan uh, penyajian yang pasti sangat menarik kalau misalnya dan waktu saya tanya apa yang mau disiap ya kira-kira proyek-proyek yang uh, vol sifatnya voluntary sebetulnya jadi uh, bukan proyek yang uh, proyek real tapi lebih ke uh, pekerjaan-pekerjaan yang melibatkan banyak sekali uh, partisipasi dari masyarakat ya saya tidak tahu persis nanti kasusnya yang mana saja tapi kita akan uh, dengarkan saja ya jadi uh, sudah siap kan? oke okay, baik saya tangan ya terima kasih pak uh, selamat sore bahasa Indonesia saya Terapa bagus. Jadi, I have to deliver this speech in this speech in in English. I hope you guys don't mind. I will try to speak as clearly as I can. I I'm invited here by Brian from Alhamata. So I'll be I'll be speaking tomorrow regarding some of my more experimental works. So today, I, I hope not to repeat what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. So today, what I'm going to probably like to share with you is some of my extracurricular projects uh, which I do. 
uh, in Malaysia, I, I'm a landscape architect. stuff that I do in my last three years. Three years ago, I took a very radical decision in my life and in my professional uh, work. Uh, I, I stopped doing commercial work. I went on a sabbatical. Uh, the reason why I did that was because I was, I think I was burnt out. I was very angry. I was very disillusioned with the stuff that we were doing. Uh, and so I, I stopped working. Uh, I was not happy that our work is doing uh, mainly commercial work. My clients are all developers or government. I felt that uh, uh, our patrons are very, very narrow. And we are doing the same old shit all the time. You know, condominiums, hotels, uh, all this very high-end development. And then also, I was very dissatisfied because we were doing a lot of overseas work at that time in China, in Vietnam, Indonesia. And that we don't have very much control over the projects. And our projects were rather superficial in that sense. Uh, in the, on the, because I think if we want to do really good work, we really need to understand local culture and local arts, local workmanship, local weather. And when they fly into very different places like Dubai or China, we only have very superficial understanding of the, the local conditions. And then we started to do all this work. So I also decided at that time, three years ago, that I would not do any more overseas work. So today, I'm back at work in my office. Uh, I don't do overseas work anymore. And in the last three years, I was just really trying to find myself uh, and try to find the meaning of lens, my, my, my work, which is landscape architecture or architecture or design. Um, I like to kind of uh, find ways in which we can actually employ ourselves without having to depend on big developers or government. So I was trying to uh, find ways of creating projects ourselves. Because now with social media, with crowdsource, uh, crowdfunding, uh, we can actually uh, put a project out into the market without a client uh, and we can actually uh, get projects done. So that's what I'm, I'm, I would like to share with you uh, today. Uh, so in 2013, that's five years ago, not three years ago, when I stopped working, the first project I did was this one here. It was actually a very, very political project. Because at that time, Malaysia was having its general election, Pilihan Raya, uh, whatever you know. Uh, and the government was at the verge of falling. So I thought maybe, uh, and I was approached by this young girl, Anwar Ibrahim's daughter. She was only less than 30 years old at that time. She got no money. She had a great vision for the country. And she was competing in my constituency, which is Bangsa, a very urban, a very cosmopolitan uh, uh, constituency with people from, who are very rich to the people who are the poorest. It's a very, it's, a, it's almost a microcosm uh, of Malaysia. Many different races, Chinese, Indians, Malays. So she, she was competing against a very, very powerful politician with a lot of money. Uh, and she came and approached some of us to help her in the visual campaign, uh, you know, putting up flags and stuff like that. Uh, of course, we don't have the type of money to buy advertisements or put up big uh, banners. So we came up with the idea that, okay, let's try to use social media and we'll outsource all this campaign to every single one of the people out there that supports her. So we call it the Malaysian Spring Campaign because we have 
I, I told her I wanted to plant flowers. I'm a landscape architect anyway. And I want to plant flowers in all the public areas. Uh, so it becomes the kind of like an occupied movement where we reclaim back what we think is ours, uh, public area for public use. Because I think too many public areas in Malaysia, I don't know about Indonesia, has been taken away from us, uh, either for development uh, or it's not usable by us. So this movement is about planting flowers and also reclaiming back public areas. So the campaign was about getting a lot of people uh, to plant, to make this kind of like flowers uh, and we'll plant them up during the election period. Uh, the first lot of flowers that we did, we got about 10,000 flowers done. Uh, it was done by all these volunteers. It looks like this when we planted up them out in the public area, in roundabouts, roadsides. Uh, the idea is almost like in Europe, springtime, the flowers suddenly all come out and it becomes very colourful. Uh, and that is our campaign material uh, to kind of uh, campaign for Nuru Isa, this young girl who is standing for election. Uh, so how we do it is that we plant uh, 10,000 flowers on a Sunday and after that we put out this social media message to everybody out there in the constituency or even the whole of Malaysia and we told them we wanted 3 million flowers <laughs> planted during the period of the campaign which is about maybe 3 weeks uh, and we teach them how to do it we, in, the, in the website we have uh, we have uh, uh, videos to teach people how to make the flowers and where to plant it. And when they have planted it, we wanted them to take photographs and then they send it to us. And then we will tabulate uh, the numbers of flowers planted. So uh, very shortly after we planted it, obviously we never get permission to do things like that. And I'm a person who never likes to get permission. Because in Malaysia and in this part of the world, I think, it, my philosophy is it is much easier to get forgiveness than to get permission. <laughs> so, so after we planted the 10,000 flowers in the roundabout, immediately on the same day, the local authorities and the police came. Uh, and they said that we have trespassed into the public property and this is not allowed. So they, they confiscated everything and put it into their van. And when they were about maybe 70% plucking out, the residents starts to come out of their houses. The cars which is going around the roundabout start to horn and there was a big commotion and more and more people came out into the streets. And then they started to confront the local authority and the police about why they are destroying things like that. Uh, and they got so angry at one stage, I thought there would be a riot. <laughs> I was there, I was standing, I didn't do anything but observing. But at one stage it was almost uh, got to a stage of riot and obviously the police officers and the uh, local city hall people got a bit worried I think. And they agreed for us to take back everything from, from their car here. Uh, so we took everything out and this was about maybe 6.30 in the evening, it was getting dark. And I said, okay, we take it back, we will plant it some other time. Uh, let's take it back to my office or my house. But the residents refused. They said, no, we want to plant every single one back. And they, they went back and hundreds of people were on the round about planting. And they planted back everything. And by 7.30, everything was back to normal. So I think that generated a lot of attention in the media. And after that, immediately after that, uh, people started to do it all around the country. Uh, it went into shopping centers, it, become, it became almost like an art project. Uh, different artists were interpreting it differently. Uh, they started to use different recycled material, uh, batik and everything else. Uh, recycling bottles, mineral bottles. Uh, we went out to a lot of public areas where there's a lot of high exposure to, the, to cars and traffic. It was planted by the thousands and thousands. 
we recorded probably about 300,000. I didn't get 3 million, unfortunately. <laughs> I think we recorded about 300,000. So artists were just reinterpreting it. Uh, it became a, a festival. And, and this number, as I said, reached about 300,000 at the end of the campaign. We managed to win the election. We got Nuru Izzat a seat, just by a few thousand seats. She was, she was, the prediction that the poll tells us that she, she was going to lose. But we managed to pull her through. So, so after this project, I think it taught me, especially, uh, a way of doing things is by mass participation, of getting people involved in actually building things. So my next project was this uh, urban farm. It is for a group of uh, refugee students. In Malaysia, there's almost a million refugees, from, especially from Rohingyas, but also from Sudan and Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan. And when they come to Malaysia without a local identity card or, or a citizenship, they cannot go to local schools. So all these kids are, are not allowed to go to school. And Dignity is a school to kind of, it's like a guerrilla school, which takes in all these students and gives them an education. So uh, uh, this project is about trying to get the kids also not to just get a classroom education, but also to learn a, a kind of a in, informal education like uh, running a cafe, hairdressing, sewing, farming. Uh, so uh, the pastor that was running this school, this school has got about 1,000 students from 15 different nationalities. So uh, the pastor came to me and said, hey, uh, can we maybe try to set up a kind of a kitchen farm for the kids uh, to learn how to grow, but also as a kind of an outdoor classroom to teach them biology, agricultural science. Uh, and we said, okay, no problem. So what we did, the first thing we did was we, we shipped in a container. Very secretly, overnight, we dropped a container onto a public piece of no man's land out, outside, and then we put in all our equipments in there on the Saturday, and then on the Sunday, we, we, we or on Saturday itself, we put out a social media message and asked for volunteers to come and help us to build an urban farm. And then on Sunday itself, people start to turn up, and then within a period of maybe four hours, we built garden walls, we built a uh, 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 vegetable beds. Uh, we brought in a lot of herbs and almost instantly completed a farm, uh, which is about double the size of this room uh, in a very urban part of Kuala Lumpur. Uh, so these are some of the pictures taken during then, and then of course again, I wanted it to be quite festive. Festive, so we share food. We have makans there, and then we finish it. And of course, shortly after we finish it, again, <laughs> the local authority came. Uh, our local authority is called DBKL, Dewan Bandaraya Kuala Lumpur. These are the people uh, that they came and they said again, hey, you have trespassed into our land, uh, this is not on. Uh, again, they give us a kind of a summon. Uh, and they wanted us to go into City Hall uh, next week, uh, the week after to meet with the uh, head of department, the enforcement or whatever. So we can say, okay, we'll come in and we'll try to explain to you what we're trying to do. So we went, uh, three of us went, myself, the pastor, and another girl who helped us to build this farm. We went in and we showed them what we, we did. We showed them before, we showed them after. Of course, uh, the deputy mayor at that time who came into the meeting, she was not impressed at all. When she walks into the meeting, the first thing she said, you guys have trespassed my land, uh, and, and this is not on. You know, if you allow you to do that, there will be a lot of other people that will follow suit. So we said, please give us a chance to explain to you. So we explained to them, show them slides, show them before, show them after. And at the end of that meeting, she not only allowed us to use a piece of land, she gave us more land. <laughs> so now we are planning uh, a lot more things uh, along that strip of uh, public land. 
uh, and we're getting permission to do it. So I guess, uh, and now, yeah, so this, some of these are the later uh, areas that we put in. And of course we have a, uh, a cafe run by the, by the, by the kids uh, nearby. So all the kitchen produce and the farm produce the vegetables goes in, into this cafe. We teach the kids how to be chefs, to be uh, service managers and whatever. And, and they want a cafe to generate money to kind of pay for their own schooling. Uh, and this cafe got actually so notorious that you've got guys like that who came in later. He's the uh, secret agent for the President of the United States. And Obama came uh, to actually visit the, the farm as well as the, uh, the cafe. So, I guess I guess that gives us a, a lot of actually uh, validation in terms of what we do, I guess. Uh, and, and from there, uh, my next project was this one here in Thailand. Uh, I don't do overseas work, as I say, but this one I have to make an exception because the person who came and visited me was this monk here. He's a forest monk uh, who walks the forest in Thailand. And he's been walking the forest for 17 years before he starts to kind of slow down as he gets older. And as he slowed down, a lot of uh, villages and tribal people up in the mountain was giving him children. Children that have no parents because there is a war going on there in Myanmar, uh, especially on Myanmar side. The, the border is very porous. We don't even know which side is Thailand and which side is Myanmar. So a lot of these kids have no parents. They were given to this uh, forest mom uh, who who wanders, the, wanders around, kids like that, 10 years old, uh, 8 years old. This is the Myanmar-Thailand border. So these kids have got very, very little resources. Uh, it, there's extreme poverty there. Uh, uh, in an area which is all mountainous, the town that he brought all these kids to is this town called Mae Hon Son. Uh, it's about 100,000 population. Uh, very rural. This is the site that he said he, he bought. He came to see me and said, I got a site like that. Can you help us to uh, build a children's home? Uh, and of course, as I say, the kids are extremely poor. We can only at that time house them in schools. So the kids uh, study in the classroom and at night they sleep in the classroom. And then they have very little resources. So they, they get very little food and stuff like that. Not the, not the most ideal condition for, for children at that age. So I, I gather a few of my friends, uh, they're very good friends of mine. Uh, one is a photographer, David Long. One is an architect, Chris Wong from Sea Arch Architect. Joseph Fu, graphic designer. Yu Leong, film maker. Uh, and, and Mr. Lau, who is a landscape contractor. We all went up to the site. The site is beautiful, it's got a river. We have to cross the river to get to the site. This is the site. Paddy Field, surrounded by mountains. We were obviously very inspired and by the land and of course by the mission that this forest monk was wanting to, to do. So we immediately sat down that night, we started drawing uh, some of these very, very basic sketches. And almost the next day we started to construct. And within a year, just over a year, we got this building built. Uh, this is the children's home. Uh, it's a very long building, about 170 meters long by 7 meters wide. The kids' house is underneath this uh, building. This, this thing that you see here with the opening are all their bathrooms, which are naturally ventilated. So the building is almost inspired by a earring that I was wearing at that time from Thailand. It's an S kind of shape. Uh, it's, it's very long. Uh, because we are up in the mountain, uh, we have, it's very difficult to get materials. So we resorted that we wanted to use concrete to do it. We, we got a set of a form work done in Chiang Mai. We shipped it up, it's still form work. And the module is about maybe three or four meters wide. And it just gets repeated uh, along the entire stretch of the 170 meters. So seven meters wide, uh, it's almost like a long house. Uh, I, I do a lot of buildings tomorrow uh, when I talk about some of the, my, my buildings. A lot of my buildings don't have doors, don't have windows, don't have nothing. Because those are very expensive material. 
I only can afford a roof over the head and the floor on which to stand on. So this one is informed by that type of houses that I do. It's just a roof and a floor. And the kids participate in uh, building it themselves. So the kids on day one, they started to set up camps. Yeah, this is day one. They were clearing the land. They were helping us to clear the foundation. <laughs> a lot of people accuse me of child labor. <laughs> I, think, I think we got the kids involved purely is I want them to take ownership of the building. It's a building which they built themselves. And of course, they work very, very hard. But I was joking about the child labor part because most of the work actually are done by the local villages. They have never poured concrete before. So we will teach them how to pour concrete, uh, how to mix concrete. Uh, and of course, the kids, after the photograph, they were playing in, in the river. So this is finished. And this whole project costs us about uh, 500,000 US to build. And all the money was raised through social media. Donations, we were selling cakes, selling photographs, selling notebooks. Uh, and it just, we didn't stop, the project didn't stop because the money just came pouring in and we've managed to finish it, I think within 13 or 14 months. And then now uh, the project looks like this. The kids are starting to plant their own food they are all vegetarians, so they plant their own paddy, they plant their own vegetables. They are also planting on top of the roof. So in order to keep the roof uh, cooler, I, I, I put a thick layer of soil up there. So they are planting groundnuts and planting paddy up there. And because uh, there is one section for boys and one section for girls, some of them they need a bit more privacy. This is the girls section. We have no money, as I say, to make doors or screens or whatever. So we just ask the monk to contribute all their monk ropes. <laughs> and we sew them up into curtains for, for the privacy for the girls section. Uh, we, I, I, for a lot of these projects, I don't do drawings. The drawings are all done on site, just sketches on the floor, on the wall. And it will just get built that way. So we use uh, entry. This is my... <laughs> to do bamboo. Uh, we use bamboo for all the uh, bedings and the tables and cupboards and things like that. Uh, and then we have a compression system. We just compress it from the, from the ceiling down to the floor. The gap that you see there is the expansion joint because the, 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 the building is so long. Instead of doing very fancy rubberized expansion joint, we just pull the building apart for expansion. And then we put a piece of glass there for natural light to come in. So this is the boys section here. Uh, all the bamboos are almost like a forest of bamboo and they will build their little houses around it with their blankets and whatever just to get themselves some privacy. It becomes their wardrobe, it's also their bed, it is also their wood table. And, uh, and of course because these people have never poured concrete before, everything is very rough. So this also has given me a very big lesson in my life because if you were to ask me to look at stuff like this, concrete with rebar exposed or cement bags left in concrete, it, let's say 20, 10 years ago, I would have screamed at the contractor. <laughs> I would reject the work. But now, these projects like this teach me to be appreciative of imperfections. It is no longer about these small little details. The big the bigger details, I guess, is in how we improve the life of some of these children uh, and how architecture can improve humanity and things like that. So it gives me a totally different perspective of what my work is all about. Uh, so, so projects like this are very important to inform my office. This is the picture of the, the toilets that I, I talk about. We channel a lot of the paddy field water into the toilet area. So the kids wash, wash their clothes here. Sometimes they also take their bath here if they want to. They've got proper shower rooms behind. And then on top, they, they have natural ventilation. We also did a lot of uh, kind of like guest houses for the workers, but also for some of us when we go there. 
and those, some of these smaller buildings are all constructed uh, using very temporary materials like leaves. They have a lot of thick leaves there, so we use it for for the buildings. And then later, we also built a few more of these small little chalets, which is across the river, for the kids to run it as a, a kind of like a guest house, as A, B, and B. When the kids run it, they get income from it, and they, they use the money to fund their, often, their, their food and their school fees and things like that. So now all of them afford, can afford to be in a house, they are properly taken care of, uh, they go to school every morning, and this is what it is all about. I guess it's not about that cement bag in the concrete anymore. It's about that smile on the face of some of these kids. And then later, I think uh, projects like that also lead to some of closer to home what we do in Malaysia. We have a big flood uh, about maybe two or three years ago in Malaysia, a lot of houses was wiped out uh, in the eastern part of Malaysia. We went in to build uh, some of these kind of flood relief houses where we tried to lift some of the building high up from the ground. We completed this building in three days with volunteers, again using a lot of social media and, and volunteers. Uh, we set up camps there and in, in that three, three days, we got all these architectural students and other students coming in to build a house for this little boy here. And, and using some of the stuff that we have been using in a lot of our projects. Uh, you know, handmade stuff like faucets, uh, hand basins, gabion walls, bamboos. Uh, and using techniques that is not so traditional, but the idea is to try to bring in some of this stuff that we can actually get from local hardware stores. Uh, but to build slightly differently. So even for foundation, uh, whatever, where we pile in three uh, rods to hold the building, uh, just to hide the foundation, it's not necessarily a concrete that you normally do. But it's just a simple uh, uh, chicken wires with stones in it, and the toilet's uh, privacy. We were experimenting with all kinds of things. Nidonium that were designed, uh, destroyed by the floods, we were picking them up from the, from the area slotting them into the gated walls just to provide privacy for some of the bedrooms and for the toilets and booths. Um, and up there, I don't know whether you notice, it's just a mud balls. We were just making mud balls and throwing into the gated. So construction material can be anything, uh, especially stuff that we can find on site. Uh, it's a matter of how we compose it. So. At the end of the day, the building looks a bit like this on, on the third day. Those wires that you see there, um, uh, I, I use a lot of plant material in I think the, the, the screen material is also our, our vegetable baits. Um, so after the uh, Malaysian spring project where we planted flowers in all these public areas, some of my activist friends, troublemaker friends, they are not satisfied. They say, after the election, what are we going to do? So we decided together that, okay, let's continue on planting, okay? And continue on occupying. And this is the project which resulted from that. Uh, five years ago, after the election, we went and said, uh, we will start a, a kind of community farm. Uh, so we decided that, okay, let's Let's take a different route. Let's not be so uh, revolutionary and try to take over government land without permission. Let's go and apply for a big piece of land and we'll do a community farm. So we went and, and we applied. We went and applied to DBKL and to Tanaka National who owns the land. Uh, we, we did drawings like this uh, to show what we can do, what the component permaculture, flowers, fountains, and lookout points, and stuff like that. And then we drew them all these fancy drawings. And we approached a lot of government departments, and we got stuck. We got stuck for almost three years. We were bounced from one department to another, and nothing happened. Until finally, we managed to get hold of one department in uh, DBKL called Local Agenda 21. I'm sure they, are, they exist here in Indonesia too. 
Local Agenda 21 is about trying to support people uh, making community effort from and, and doing things from ground up. So they came and they helped us and they finally managed to get permission to do to get to do this vision. And the site that we have is very close to the roundabout where we planted the flowers. It's underneath a transmission line. It's actually a transmission reserve. It is uh, 40 meters wide and we got about 8 acres of land given to us. So we got a, a lot of kids involved. Uh, we wanted, again, kids to take ownership. We have a lot of engagement meetings, big meetings like this, where we have to explain to them some of the ideas. Local residents, we, we have a lot of meetings with government departments, engagement, uh, design sessions, uh, kids on site. This is Nuru Isa, by the way. She is now our, our parliamentarian. She's very involved in this whole process too. I get a lot of students like yourself coming to help in the design, so they will be doing a lot of different options and looking at things like that. Uh, experimenting with growing plants using hydroponics, uh, having meetings in cafes. And then we got to site and volunteers start to come in and we started building. We started this project in uh, September last year, so we are probably about six months now. We started the plant paddy in a very urban environment, in the paddy fields. Uh, basically, really, it's to teach young people how where food comes from. I think in Indonesia, it's obvious. You guys are still planting paddy. In Malaysia, we totally have forgotten what paddy field looks like or how paddy comes, what paddy look, uh, where paddy comes from. So it's about educating these kids. And then we started uh, the vegetable farms teaching people how to do composting. So we are approaching all the restaurants nearby. They are contributing all their kitchen waste to us now. We recycle them and make them into compost. Uh, just to reduce the amount of uh, waste that we put onto the uh, landfill. Uh, Andre was here, was there last week, right? Uh, last week, or week, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, and Andre teaches how to build a reciprocal frame greenhouse. Uh, Andre, just for your information, like all my other projects, the authority came again and said, really? and they asked us to take down this structure. Oh. <laughs> I'm still negotiating down there. <laughs> so we get a lot of volunteers. Malaysian Spring, we planted all these artificial flowers. This is about the real flowers. We, want, we plant millions of flowers. Every Koto Royal that we have every two weeks, we are planting flowers. And kids are involved. Many, many people are involved. Uh, to them, it's planting flowers. To me, it is about planting a hope in people. That in Malaysia, there is still hope. Our government is totally corrupt and a lot of people are leaving our country. I need to bring the people back into the country. And in order to do that, we must build hope back into the people that we can actually help ourselves. If government cannot help us, local authority cannot help us, we help ourselves. I guess that's the message that we are, we are trying to do. So these are our flower fields now, six months later. All the water jets are now in, are going already, as shown in the concept drawing just now. We are planting a lot of vegetables. All these vegetables are harvested every few weeks, and we don't eat it ourselves. Because we felt that if we eat it ourselves, there'd be a lot of trouble because all of us were fighting who is going to collect. So we decided that all our produce is going to go out and to feed the homeless the, than the poor people. So all the produce goes up to like uh, all these soup kitchens uh, and they cook to feed the, the urban poor and the homeless in the city. Now we are starting to breed bees to get honey. So that's that project, and I think uh, this probably is this one of the last or second last project. So my my last three years, I've been fighting a lot with local, local authority and police. I get I get I get called at the police station a few times already. But I decided also that maybe I can work with them, and this is one project which I want to share with you how I work with the local authority. Uh, and this job was uh, maybe about six months ago. The local authority called me up. They said, hey, you talk so much uh, about all these things. Why don't you come in and help the city? I said, sure. Give me a project. And they give me this project. Uh, it's a, a pocket park in the middle of the city. It looks like that now. 
it's got water running down a wall. Uh, very not very well used and not very well maintained. So we we me and Ting City, which is like an urban rejuvenation organization, uh, is it's a CSR arm attached to a government linked company. They are very very rich. So Ting City and me started to work with DPKL to convert this thing uh, from here to here. Uh, I told them, you have all your water pumps and all your electrical services, I don't attach that. All your balancing tanks and all your uh, whatever, which is underground structures, we want to use back everything, but I'm going to totally transform uh, this, this man-made water element into a very natural uh, river. Why a river? Because uh, in, in Kuala Lumpur recently we did this major project of cleaning up the Klang River. We spent six billion ringgit uh, to do it. It's called the River of Life project. I wanted to do a project which is like tongue in cheek to kind of say that we are the source of that river. Uh, you know that, that, that rivulet that feeds into that river. So yeah, so this is the before and that's the after. We have a lot of public consultation again, uh, getting people to tell us what they like, what they don't like. So then, when people start to participate, it, hopefully we felt that maybe they can have a sense of ownership. That this is not something that is designed by City Hall and us and given to them, but they have hardly contributed to this project. So, we went up to the source of the Klang River. This is in Kuala Lumpur, okay? I didn't believe it when a friend of mine brought me to the source of the dirty Klang River which is just like one of those major rivers in Jakarta, which is filthy when you are in Kuala Lumpur, but at the source, it's absolutely clean. Uh, you can see from the top to the bottom. So I was so inspired by this little river, uh, we brought it into the city. I, I copied it, basically, uh, and brought it into the city. Uh, and the idea is also not designing something just for people, but it is about design. We, have, we need to be more inclusive. Then. Therefore, we need to think about the small insects, the small animals, the birds. We are trying to create an environment, a biophilic environment in our city to showcase that in the future, because of the speed of development that our cities are going through, that we cannot ignore nature. We must build nature into whatever we are building, however small it is. So, and when you have water and things like that, nature naturally comes in. So, you saw me in the source of the Klang River, right? This is in the city. <laughs> this is Mio from my office. He got so excited, he took up all his clothes and he jumped into that, that artificial stream that we built. And, and he forgot to take up his uh, headphone. <laughs> his expensive uh, phone dot 8 was inside his, uh, his pocket. <laughs> So yeah, the idea was yeah to try to just recreate a bit of small little nature in the middle of the city. We brought in moss. This was all taken within weeks of completion. Uh, this is probably my last project. Uh, the other one that we are trying to do now in Kuala Lumpur is to, to kind of, if you don't ask, you never be given. So we are now very, very thick skinned this thing that we, we just got to go and ask. So one day, a few of us were having uh, Teh Tarik, and we said, hey, come, let's uh, talk to this developer uh, and see whether what we can get out of him. So we make an appointment, we went to meet this very rich developer, and say, hey, we want to do something for you uh, in relation to the community. How can we work with you? Then the developer, first question he asked us was, you want money or you want uh, a building? We told them we didn't want we don't we don't want his money, but we know that he has got a warehouse. This warehouse, which is not used, so we asked for it. So immediately they gave us two years free rental to use this space, and but we were not satisfied. We said two years not enough. We want three years. <laughs> so he has got to go out and call all his partners. And finally, we got three years free rental. We are releasing this space back into the community where we try to give free rental to people who need a building like this to do all kinds of experimental work, especially in regards to arts. Um, so students will come in and do installations, performances, 
stuff like this, if you don't give an avenue, they, it's very hard for them to, uh, to, to do this type of, of uh, event, especially in a quite big scale. And, and this building allows us now to kind of experiment with, with very uh, interesting things like that. And my last project is this thing called the Kramat Unity Bridge, where we are trying to build a bridge to connect a Malay kampong to a Chinese new village. In Malaysia, that is a no-no, because all of us are segregated by race. The Chinese are the bad guys, the Malay are the bad guys, the Indian are the bad guys, all of us are bad guys to each other. But I think this, <laughs> this is a project about trying to, to challenge that and say we want to build a, a, a bridge to connect two villages, and we do a lot of engagement. The, the Malay village initially agreed to it, the Chinese village had a bit of hesitation, but now they have agreed to it too. So, we, we are now uh, working with some architects to design the bridge that connects uh, that side to this side. And this side is extremely poor. This is called the Colombian Flats. This is where all the drug, deal, the drug deals are done in, in KL. So I think, uh, I guess that's all. <laughs> So tomorrow I'll be talking at Anabata. Tomorrow I'll be talking.